what are the basic processes in cosmic evolution? If you eliminate the Big Bang, you throw out inflation, throw out dark energy, you throw out dark matter. Can we explain cosmic evolution in terms of processes that we understand and can test here on Earth and in the solar system within reach of our uh, spacecraft, which are part of our experimental apparatus? We find we can, and there are certain key processes that are involved in cosmic evolution. First of all, there are processes dealing with the forces of electromagnetism. Plasma processes dealing with, as I say, plasma where electrons are stripped off of atoms and are free to move. And I'll get into some of these processes in just a second. Obviously, gravitation is extremely important at large scales and at small scales. And finally, the universe has been shaped by nuclear reactions, especially fusion reactions that have built up the elements. So very briefly, let's go through some of these concepts that are important in understanding the real evolution of the cosmos, and unfortunately are basically ignored in both the education of the average astrophysicist and in most astrophysical work. Not all, most. In doing so, we are going to use a basic method that is enunciated here by Hannes Alfein, the pioneer of plasma physics, 1970 Nobel laureate in physics, to try to write a grand cosmical drama leads necessarily to myth, to try to let knowledge substitute ignorance in increasingly large areas of space and time is science. So we're not trying to say, oh, we can write a better origin of the universe story by saying what our equations tell us the universe must have been like, which is what the dominant theory of cosmology is. No, we work outward from our knowledge of the universe here on Earth to the solar system and outward from there. And of course, going backwards at the same time in time. First basic principle that has shaped the universe is the pinch effect, discovered by Ampere two centuries ago. Pinch effect occurs when two electric currents are traveling in the same direction. The magnetic fields created by those currents create forces which draw those currents together. So there's an attractive force created by magnetic fields created by currents. So that means that currents moving in the same direction attract each other in the opposite direction, repel each other. And this can be proven, including with recent simulations, to mean that small random currents in a plasma at any scale tend to grow to be bigger and bigger organized currents. Second phenomena, anisotropic conductivity, magnetized plasma. This means that in a plasma that is not terribly dense, not like the density of stars, the magnetic field is sufficiently strong that particles, either electrons or ions, will travel in circles around magnetic field direction and only occasionally collide to move in the direction perpendicular to the field. That means even if the electric field is almost perpendicular to the magnetic field, the current will move in the direction of the magnetic field, not in the direction of the electric field. There's a phenomenon we've studied a great deal in fusion plasmas. It's dominant throughout the universe and unfortunately is not that much understood. Uh, this was one of Alfane's pet peeves, which he actually talked about in his Nobel acceptance speech, that people were misunderstanding certain concepts he had developed and therefore were dealing with what he called 
pseudoplasmids, not real plasmids as they exist in the universe. If you put these two phenomena together, the binge effect and anisotropic, uh, anisotropic conductivity, you get force-free plasma vortex filaments as a key structure in the universe. These are filaments that are cell arranged that at all points, the current is moving along the magnetic field direction. So they have a very uh, tight screw spiral along the outside, a looser spiral towards the center, and then current moving straight along the axis. This is what we see everywhere in the universe is fractal hierarchies of these vortex filaments. For years, we've seen this in this wonderful Hubble space telescope, uh, false color image of the Bale Nebula. The colors are not realistic, but the structure is, and you can see the whole structure exactly as in the diagram, the helix around the outside, the straight line towards the center, and filaments breaking down into smaller filaments or larger filaments built up out of large ones. From JWST, we have this contribution. People have already said it's highly hypnotic. This is a nearby galaxy, M74, face on. And through the infrared, we see the same structure of filaments for inside filaments a fractal structure forming the, the skeleton of this galaxy along which the stars are forming. This occurs at all scales. This is our fusion plasmas inside our small dense plasma focus device. These same filaments occurring at centimeter scales. This is star forming filaments at parsec scales. This is a very recent radio telescope image of a nearby cluster of galaxies showing these long twisting filaments, a pair of filaments. And for scale, this letter E would be almost exactly the same size as the Milky Way. So if you put the Milky Way in these filaments, these would be filaments capable of leading to the formation of the Milky Way galaxy. Because what's happening is a third process, a homopolar generator, Faraday disk generator process, uh, enough discovered by Faraday, in which if you have a rotating conductor in a magnetic field, such as a rotating disk of gas inside one of these filaments, you produce a electric potential between the outside and the inside towards the axis and current starts to flow perpendicular. And since the current can flow perpendicular to the field, the current actually creates its own magnetic field, its own vortices, so it can flow along these filaments that we see in spiral galaxies. So basically what's happening is a large vortex breaks down gravitation along its axis. So where angular momentum doesn't fight gravity because it's breaking down along the axis. And then these spinning blobs get their own set of spiral filaments to carry current from the outside to the inside of each of these smaller elements, which depending on the scale might be a cluster of galaxies, a galaxy, star cluster, an individual star. 30 years ago, my colleague, Tony Parat made these supercomputer simulations, starting with a, oh, excuse me, a blob of, two blobs of plasma, presumably uh, condensed by gravity, in a magnetic field, which would be perpendicular to the plane of the image, and within two, rotations by magnetic forces and electrical forces alone, gravity isn't built into this model, 
they form a striking spiral galaxy uh, with many of the quantitative features we see in real spiral galaxies. Back again in 30 years ago, I used these models to show what plasma physics could tell us about the formation of a galaxy um, and the formation of stars in the galaxy. The model predicted that larger stars, but not supernova size, basically up to 10 times the mass of our sun would form first. They would be very uh, bright stars forming lots of helium and through cosmic rays, both deuterium and lithium would form. And the amount of these elements would be formed in the amounts that we actually observe in young galaxies. So all of these light elements would be formed through the action of galaxies that would be formed by plasma processes that we can understand here in the lab. The prediction that young galaxies were forming helium at an extremely high rate relative to their mass was borne out by the later discovery of the ultra-luminous IR galaxies, which are forming uh, helium at a rate per unit mass, about 100 to 1,000 times that of the present Milky Way. It's been long known that the energy that must have been generated by the formation of a quarter of the, of the helium in the universe, which is a quarter of the mass of hydrogen being converted into helium, by some strange coincidence, produce the amount of energy that we now observe in the cosmic microwave background. We know that energy was thermalized by dust in early galaxies to about 20 K. How was it thermalized further to 2.7 K? Well, again, we go back to plasma phenomena. There's one more plasma phenomenon that we have observed in the lab and we can now extrapolate to the universe, which is the production of plasmids. What happens when you have converging filaments, they tend to merge together, twist together, and then they start to kink like an old landline of a telephone. And it kinks and it sort of twists on its side and forms a tiny plasmoid, which is kinked up in all three dimensions. We've observed these plasmoids in the lab. And back in the 1980s, I hypothesized that these are at the core of phenomena like quasars and herbic harrow uh, objects. These plasmoids in the lab decay rapidly and produce beams of highly accelerated electrons and ions. This is an artist's conception of our plasmoid in the lab. This is a real picture of a similar beam produced at much greater scale by a quasar. These beams have to create a hierarchical filament of very dense uh, magnetic vortex filaments. The electrons trapped in these filaments, which survive for billions or tens of billions of years, scatter light at microwave and radio frequency radiation, not at shorter radiation uh, wavelength. So these filaments created by quasars, uh, AGN and other phenomena create a radio fog, which thermalizes and smooths the CMB to the situation that we now observe. I published these theories again 30 years ago, Astrophysical Journal and so on. The evidence that we live in a microwave fog is if you look out into a fog, the light that is scattered by a fog obviously dims faster than one over R squared. And if we look at nearby galaxies, we find that the radio luminosity goes down much faster and the IR luminosity. And this is at distances 100 
200, 300 megaparsecs that are far too small for there be, to be significant evolution. So this is clear proof that we're living in a radio fog, not a opaque radio fog, but a radio fog that does produce the CMB. So in these many papers we have published, and especially in these two big ones, we see that all cosmic processes can be explained with lab-tested physics, except the Hubble process. You ask me what causes the Hubble process, I will say, I don't know, but what is clear from the work that I and Ricardo and Renato have done that the universe is not expanding. That means that the redshift has to be caused by something that happens to the light as it travels these long distances. And we know pretty exactly what the formula is because its redshift is proportional to distance. Now, the good thing about this is we can study that experimentally. If we put up satellites that have sufficiently sensitive instruments within present day technology, we can study this at distances of millions of kilometers in the solar system. And hopefully we will in the coming decade or so. Well, what does all this have to do with us? Uh, it's not just cosmology that's in crisis, humanity's in crisis. And uh, this crisis has been obvious since the beginning of the pandemic, but it doesn't date back just to the pandemic. This graph shows the evolution of energy growth and the evolution of mortality decline in the human race since the Second World War. And what we see is things were getting pretty rapidly better. The rate of mortality decline was very rapid back in the good old 60s. And so was the rate of energy growth. In the decades that followed, both of those growth rates declined and we entered a period of near stagnation, which was partially broken by the entry of China into the world economy in the first decades of the 21st century. Now these curves have turned sharply downward. We are definitely in a period of retreat and decline. How long that period lasts is determined by what we do now. To get out of this crisis, we need to do many things. But one of the things we absolutely need to do is to get more energy. We need more energy, cheaper energy. I don't think I have to persuade people of that these days. Cleaner energy and high energy density. So we are not using billions of tons of fuel as we are today to get our energy. To make a long story short, the only way we can do that, we can fulfill those four needs, is with fusion energy. The power that drives the stars, the power of the sun, the power that drives the universe. To get control of the power that drives the universe, we have to understand the processes that drive cosmic evolution. Just like the Wright brothers needed to understand how birds fly to create a controllable flying machine. We have to understand these phenomena to create fusion devices that work. In tokamaks, which are the dominant device, these filaments are uncontrolled and they lead to disruption. And they can even destroy the machine itself. In our device, a different kind of device, which has been around for a long time called the dense plasma focus, we use these filaments to create the conditions for fusion. Let's see whether this works. So what happens is filaments are created by a pulse of electricity stored in capacitors that moves through these quite small electrodes. The electrodes are 
centimeters across and naturally forms these filaments, which become to uh, start to heat up. And they move through their own forces to the end of the anode, which is that central cylinder. They pinch together and they kink into this tiny plasmoid. Obviously, of course, this is animation by Torof Greek, uh, who was the first to show exactly how those plasmoids could form. Plasmoids heat up to, we have measured 260 keV, 200 times the temperature in the center of the sun. And they can be used to burn PV11 fuel, which forms pure helium as an um, end product. So we've seen these filaments in ICCD exposures. This is a five nanosecond exposure. And we've seen the plasmoids, uh, which are, as I say, quite tiny in our experiments on Earth. Where we are going with these experiments using hydrogen boron fuel is to develop generators that would fit in a garage and develop enough power to uh, fuel 4,000 American homes. So that's one connection. There's a second connection, which is to overcome the crisis, you have to win humanity as a whole to rationality, to the scientific method. We have seen all over the world people dying needlessly. In our country, we have had over 1 million deaths, 90% more avoidable deaths, because primarily because people do not judge correctly scientific findings, such as about the, uh, the validity of vaccines. As Alfain wrote 40 years ago, the Big Bang has caused science to become increasingly presented as the negation of common sense. The line between science and pseudoscience tended to be erased. And it was difficult to tell the difference between science and science fiction. If you present as the highest popular incarnation of science as the Big Bang theory, cosmologists as the smartest scientists, the, the priesthood, and you say, okay, believe inflation, the Big Bang, dark energy, dark matter. Oh, my colleagues have a vaccine to present to. It is undercutting the credibility of science, and that has to be reversed. We have to say the science of the cosmos is based on the same principles that have given us technology on Earth. The same technology that allows technological miracles like the JWST is the science we have to use for the cosmos, not something concocted on a, uh, in a computer or on a, a blackboard. And finally, the third point, and then we'll open it up for the discussion for the rest of the time, uh, cosmic evolution, as we look at it through the lens of plasma physics, is running up. What we see is a process of large scale structures developed over not billions, but trillions of years, leading to higher and higher energy flows on smaller and smaller scales of both time and space a tendency for increased energy flows, for motion away from equilibrium that we know at least on Earth has continued through the evolution of life. That cosmology as evolution is contradicted by the Big Bang cosmology as degeneration. In the Big Bang cosmology, the universe started with high energy flows 
and is degenerating over the billion years to a grim future of heat death, dispersion, meaninglessness, nothingness. In crises that humanity has faced, our greatest enemy is despair. If you look back to the great crises of the early 20th century, the Great Depression, ideologies of despair, such as fascism, developed out of people losing hope that society could get better. Those, that loss of hope was fed by ideologies that said, yes, evolution is running backwards, the earth is running down, society is decaying, the cosmos is running down, and therefore we have no choice but the devil take the hindmost. The, the core of fascism is society cannot benefit together. It has to be a, a, a competition of the strongest versus the weakest, and you better be a member of the strongest. We face that again, and science in reality, correctly understood, can say, yes, again and again, not only has humanity gone through crises, such as the depression, such as the dark ages, and come out of it stronger at a higher level, greater energy flows, but so has the universe. So has life itself. This is part of a general process of evolution. Whether the ideology of hope or the ideology of despair wins is really up to us. Which comes to my last slide. Instead of many of the things on the internet you'll see end with a word from their sponsor, well, we're going to end with a word to our sponsors, which is you. All of this research that I'm doing is funded by members of the public. We're funded by crowdfunding in which people invest, yes, in the hope that we will succeed and their investment will be worth money, but mainly to help us develop fusion. And in the process, we're funding the basic research in cosmology that helps us to develop fusion. So I hope some of you will visit uh, WeFunder and maybe see fit to chip in your $200. Thank you very much. Accelerating Advanced Fusion Energy.